While looking at a large sculpture, did you ever wonder who actually put this together? The conception of an art object has become but the first movement of an intricate dance of planning, financing, site location, and material selection. Following that, the construction of a contemporary sculpture begins. Enter the art fabricator, the actualizer who will orchestrate the various skills needed to realize the artist's vision. There are about 10 companies in the United States that fabricate large dimensional artworks. In Los Angeles, there are several. The largest is Peter Carlson and Company, and there is Jack Brogan. Since 1959, Jack has been building art objects for artists in steel, glass, acrylic, wood, and metal spray. He also restores damaged artworks for museums collectors and insurance adjusters. There's a framework which has been on the way from Hawaii for a couple of years, I mean a couple of months. Uh, we should receive it and uh, it's pipes that fit into uh, other pipes and we'll put that inside and then we'll, we'll weld those to this uh, these two members, and then uh, we'll fill up the voids on the outside and spray it with bronze. Now the lady starts with it. It's always in uh, there's burlap, then she gessoes it, and once she gets the shape she wants, she gives it to us. So, you know, right now it's kind of in development stage because the pieces will have to add quite a bit to it to make it even on the ends. Uh, I guess originally it was going to have water, uh, it was going to be a fountain, but uh, she decided just to make it a sculpture within a pool, so that's how it stands right now. Now she'll come back in about two months probably and we're going to fill in the, the sides of it and she will uh, look at it and see if she wants to change it or whatever. it and then we're going to take that and form it around and fill up the void and then we'll metal spray that to make it more rigid uh, it's kind of, and then, but we'll have little battens in there then we'll let her fold up the same stuff and put uh, make it see if she can make it look like her lap so, or we'll do that or something i figure we'll fill this thing all the way around and we'll turn it over to her I'm going to turn it over now. It's very strong already. Yeah. And this one is still very weak. Right. The side is already cleaned down. Mm -hmm. Thank 
So when we get it finished, yeah. <coughs> we can just create it and send it over there. Yeah. <coughs> We're going to have braid it or fold it? Well, we give Gilbert a little credit. He bails the braid. I just think it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it looks good. It looks great. It just looks great. 300 pound of bronze. Plus, see. <laughs> yeah, it went in. We lifted it up. I didn't. I have shots of it, you know, going in. Mm -hmm. But I was down below. So I mean, it just slipped right on there. But, well, we figured we'd be done in four hours. We got done in five. So. So we're just going to lift it enough, you're going to lift it up, we're going to pull it over, okay? Okay, now you got to come forward. That weighs uh, about 1,500 pounds. Less than a Cadillac, anyway. Oh yeah, half a Cadillac. A hundred times more expensive. They're now worth like 500 grand. Huh? It was built and it, it uh, wasn't finished as it should have been. But this guy didn't complain. The other three people, there's four pieces in the series, and they didn't accept it. We repolished those. And he got stuck with the bill on this one. The other people, the dealer paid for it. John McCracken is my name. I'm an artist, a sculptor, sometime painter. <laughs> I remember one fabricator anyway said, no, you can't polish it that much. Uh, it, it's impossible to polish stainless steel to that point. Uh, even the one that's, that's uh, doing things now, um, uh, at first thought, it, it, it couldn't be done. And, uh, but Jack was able to do it. I, one, one, one fabricator referred to that degree of polish on a stainless steel piece as being a number 12. And uh, uh, it's another, another fabricator said, you can only get to number 10. That's as far as you can go. Well, move it into the bar. Break the bar from the hand. According to the reflection, but that doesn't tell you a lot. Looks like he's putting that piece right on, so it'll sit right on the stone uh, deck. I kind of like it to be just sitting on the stone patio or on a concrete gallery floor or whatever, or wood, whatever it is. Rather than having a platform, because a platform kind of separates it, it's, so I call that the Brancusi problem, because he made things with platforms and they were kind of part of the sculpture. And, and they, that could work, but be like it, it, it floated in from outer space and landed there and just is sitting there in a natural way. I had a fire, so it sort of put me out of business for a while. And uh, kind of operated down in my garage and house. And, uh, and I had one in West LA for about six months, and then I moved to Venice. Well, how did you get to L.A.? I'm just looking for warm weather, so. <laughs> I, I used to have a concrete block uh, uh, company and did uh, sort of specialized casting for architects and uh, reinforced lentils and doorways and so on and the concrete blocks. But then I, I had spine surgery and it sort of got weather and everything bothered me, so I sold that and just came out here. Started a little shop in uh, Hollywood then, repairing antiques. And then got to doing production, woodwork, uh, adult games. Small, like cribbage boards, cribbage boards, chess boards. 
Another one called Juggalette, a little marble ball bearing up there and try to get it down without it falling off. And a little space, I think, called Space Tail. Then uh, after the fire, I just started doing this and that, commercial work, sales office, topographical map, some lobbies and, and offices and Bill Bourbon doing a prism. <laughs> he tried to find someone to machine it and do it, but um, he didn't uh, find anyone. So it's actually made from um, a sheet stock, four inches thick. And you machine it and then polish it. And machining it was a problem. And then, uh, but the woodworking experience, you know, helped on that. And, um, for as the, the lamination and doing that was, I guess, um, my chemistry background and my experience with uh, acrylic. But then the polishing was like, then they, you know, Everybody buffed things. It wasn't, you know, wasn't smooth. It wasn't r clear. The big prism was the second largest optical piece at that time uh, in '74, uh, second to the Palomar lens. So, and the clarity was um, on the scale of '95. You know, you know your eyeglasses are, you know, they have to be like '85 or whatever to, they sell them if you're lucky. And the first one was four feet, and he just, well, no, could we do eight feet? So that's when I had to come up with a process to where you didn't see the joint and it was, you know, presentable. So then it went from eight to 12, 12 to 16. <laughs> we installed it at the Art and Technology Show. That's the reason we made it 16 feet. Put it outside, and uh, so some reason the county cut it down, I guess, because they didn't have the room, you know, high enough or whatever. And if someone's having a bad day, they really don't want to discuss it. We'll do the ultramarine. Okay. So, you want a green pearl on these? I think so. What do you think? You got a good green? Uh, yeah. I don't know why Okay, we'll have to spray them and uh, <coughs> make them a little rigid. And then I'll put a, I'll mix up a finish on it. We'll do a sort of a hot rod type finish. But, uh, you know, it, it has nice effects. It, that's what I was going to put on these bags of Marlene's, you know, but she wants that solid color. Huh? I'm trying to talk her on it. Well, I think I have. She, now, but you know, she wants to leave it up to me. So <laughs> I want to make sure she's around. I don't want to do them but once. Right. We do it in aluminum and we won't have to kneel it. Yeah, we could start out and do, do them in aluminum and then, and then if we're going to do it in stainless, what we have to do is we'll have to roll and then kneel and roll again. You saw the one I had for um, Andy Moses. It has. You know, see, it has. It's not finished polish. This is about a six or seven. See the lines in there? Yeah. And I don't have this into it. And, and pride can, can probably. And see, and then it have to be on both sides. Have to, yeah, to cover it and do it on the other side. <laughs> So what I would do is take it down like this on both sides and then you could fin it and we could do the final polish. And then put it together, right? I told Jack, um, I said, if we were in Japan, Jack, you would be a national treasure. And he like, he laughed it off because he, you know, he's a very, you know, humble guy and he, you know, he didn't, <clears throat> he doesn't buy into that stuff. Uh, but really, it's true. I think that uh, if we were in some place that valued the arts uh, more than we do here, 
that he would be a national treasure, I think. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer from my point of view, at least. And I don't want to diminish the artists that, um, you know, because they had the vision and he's the one that made it happen. And that's a real critical part because a lot of people have good ideas, but the, they don't know how to make them realized. I did cigar boxes and, um, and so I started working into, th into the three-dimensional and Jack would like s say, well, you should do it this way. And, and I would come to him and I'd say, you know, these, these brass hinges are really too gaudy. They're going to really kill the piece. And what can I do to like just uh, take, take that edge off and, and just kind of push him back into the background? And the, it was a lacquered box. And, and so he gave me a special solution to soak the hinges in that turned them black. And so if I would have painted them, it would have scratched off because when you move a hinge, it just it rubs off and, you know, that's a real problem. But Jack knew how to do it so that it's going to be forever the way I wanted it to be. And, and so that was the first job that I did with Jack. He just kind of helped me out. He told me what to do and I did it myself. And, and then it just kind of built from that point on. And as we were going along, my friendship with him, I think, got, you know, deeper. The uh, artist is Charles Ray, and it's uh, like a Tonka toy, and actually I guess he made it so children can play on it, but now it's gotten to be an object that uh, the kids can't play on it, so anyhow, we restored it three times, and it's going to be displayed up at, uh, at the uh, new opening they're having. The whole thing only weighs like 5,000 pounds, so. And what's the material? Uh, fiberglass and aluminum. done things on and off. Yeah, and he yeah. helped me, when I had my retrospective, mm -hmm. rebuild some older sculptures. Mm -hmm. and he did a fantastic job. And it's always refreshing this up maybe five times. Yeah. And I always never have to go out and check it because he always does such a great job. Following the installation at LACMA, the children for whom the fire engine was designed could not play upon it as it was thought to be too valuable and fed them off from eager hands. See this bevel? Yeah. <laughs> that goes together and, and we create this 90 degree piece. Mm -hmm. But the other piece in there was damaged. I went back to New York to install it and we found out that some of the coating is missing. How was that coating applied? This is done in a vacuum chamber. And then you pull down a perfect vacuum or pull it down as perfect as possible. Uh, this is Inconel, uh, the metal on here. And uh, so that just vaporized and it sticks to the glass. And see, this is like a, this is a front surface mirror. 
So anyhow, what we're going to do, we're going to lacquer this about six coats, and then we're going to lacquer the other side, and then you see it's on an angle, so we have to cut a section of that off from there down here and then rebevel this edge. So we're not doing it, but this company that they're uh, specialized in beveling glass. Yeah, and it was beautiful. And I saw it in this uh, 42nd floor of this building in New York, looking out at uh, Central Park. But then it had that damage, and it didn't show up until we got the thing stood up. Because I had installed it about a year ago in the uh, Pace Gallery. So anyhow, uh, this was the solution. <coughs> Larry coated the pieces, and uh, we made a separation of this and, and printed that. And uh, then he coated it. So when he coated it, it he did the positive instead of the negative. So we have one that's a uh, blessing to me because I didn't want to do that. It's hard, too hard to get your head back into where you were before, even though it's the simplest sort of thing. It's, I've never been able to make something exactly like the one that got broke. You know? Has to be, it can be in the, in the neighborhood of it, but it won't be exactly the same. And uh, Jack has the ability to sort of smooth out all of the difficulties that you can run into with collectors and dealers and so on. Do you say any magic words before you seal that box up? Or? Oh, yeah. pieces we did at Pace, and uh, then in San Diego, uh, we did these panels on the wall uh, with red, yellow, blue, and then the black and the white. So what we're doing now, <coughs> we're going to develop a new series um, of it. It's like Act Two, I guess. First one to, we're going to play with is going to be black and then we're gonna shade in blue on the outside edge. And, and then uh, I'm not sure what we do from there, but the two outside panels will be white. Right now it's more just developing the colors and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and getting it to where it, where it, you know, it pleases Robert and, and uh, you know, where it's, you know, what he's looking for. I gotta create the color and the technique of the color, so. That's fun doing that. So. The other part, just labor. That's Gilbert's end of it. Yeah, it's just uh, working up. Uh, it's, it's more like a uh, hot rod color we we're going to use, I guess. It's like putting on a color and then putting candy over it. And, and that's always fun. So Erwin liked hot rods. So. I guess he had them when he was young. Bought one. Bought one a few years ago, but found out it was too much. <laughs> Takes too much time just keeping it clean and wiping on it, polishing and so on. Well, the urban panels probably have, some of them have 15 and 20 coats, so time we finish. And these will probably have more. They'll be more like 30 time we get done, I guess. I get the same around all the way around it. Let me I've had experience with resin from um, in the past, and uh, more so in acrylic. Most of the artists that was working in polyester then, there are a lot of them I then sort of, you know, 
answer the questions and help them out. Or did some of the pieces, uh, set up the processes and all that. I didn't plan on working just for artists because the commercial work was more profitable. And uh, so then I worked, uh, I guess, first one was Peter Alexander East and Helen Pashkin. And, and then I worked with Ganser and Lady Dale. And it's about everybody. And then I got to where it was just like 95% work on the artist. I guess the knowledge that I have and experience and is a little broader than most people. and. We worked in, you know, metal, wood, plastic, or whatever, and I don't know, they couldn't find anybody else to, you know, to fix it. And a lot of the pieces, you know, somebody either built or developed a process or had a hand into them, so. so now, that's the fun part, you know, of actually just figuring out uh, how to do it, and getting all that started. How do you do that? Now, I, I do it with a solvent. Yeah, I, uh, I do it with a solvent. So if I put 120, so I will get uh, about 2,000 pound pressure. So this is good. The problem comes up and I just go from there to there and then, <laughs> I don't know. That's the way I've worked for a long time, so I guess it kind of comes natural. What we're going to do next, I have to uh, put this heat band on there to take the stress out. We're going to kneel it. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yep, what I would do, I would sand that off up to the line, huh? Then the insurance company, the adjusters found me like mainly during the earthquake situation a few years ago. So, one of the things that I observe about watching everybody on your team there is that they all have a reverence for every piece that they touch, whether it's corten or glass. They handle it as a piece of art. Not there's never anything casual about. Pick it up, pick it up, how are going to pick it up, and where are they going to it Yeah, well, see, that's the whole thing. And see, if you had a big place, no way you could do that. Yeah. It's just like a, a pieces out, and, which I, the lady sent me all these requirements for insurance to do her piece. She has a licensing piece like in there on the wall, and that, you know, that polished brass. Her installer, these art movers, they go there. And they install it, and then they have instructions about gloves and all that. And then they pick it up with their hands, and they have these, you know, these, you know, and it's just like doing your fingerprint with an sure. ink pad, right? Sure. Sure. Then there's the acid and just these round. But it's not. It hasn't been easy, and we've we've had some things where we have to you know, really redo them. Well, it's like if you've seen George polish one of them, he has to wear a mask. Well, that's difficult too, you know. If anybody comes up, you got to make sure that they have a mask on, you know. Um, because then you get it finished and you got these little black dots all over it, you know. When the, uh, that's all it's, uh, no, they, they're, they're good. Gilbert's been with me about 20 years and George about 15. The other two guys, uh, we've they have they've been there maybe a year year and a half, one month. But uh, the team now is good. We just sort of we can keep up. I always wanted to be about like I am now, small. I used to do a lot of prototypes for Knoll, do a lot of quality you know woodworking, and then you know like four cabinet makers and the finisher. And oh, that's a a mock-up I did a, a portion of the for for NASA. Yeah, we did that mock-up. That was part of the space station. Is this burlap uh, sculpture? Have you ever done anything like that before? 
Oh yes, I've been doing it for a long time. In fact, when I found this system was back in the sixties, uh, late sixties, I guess. It was very interesting because you could spray just about anything. I mean, like paper. Linda Binglis, I did like maybe a hundred pieces for her over the period of time. And Linda, when I was I started doing Linda Binglis's pieces, that's one of her pieces there. And see, that's that's metal spray over stainless steel mesh, and then it's black chrome. That's challenging. I, mean, I guess that's what makes it, you know, if it's profitable and challenging, well then it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, it was like Gilbert said, <laughs> I said, well, I gotta go in now, go over those photos. He said, wow, how long is that gonna take? <laughs> he said, I have a picture of 50 McCrackens. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, we probably, we probably did 30 last year or more. This Alexander Calder mobile was damaged in a wildfire. Winds of 140 miles an hour bent several elements of the sculpture. So Jack, what is the work to be done? On, on oh, we piece? have to straighten some, uh, some of the pieces of bent, some of the fittings of bent. Then we have to repaint it. This was twisted in a 140 mile an hour wind. Yeah, we may like to polish the stainless steel. I have a little portable setup that I made. And uh, yeah, we'll make it look good. And the insurance is counting on it. So. <laughs> yeah, That's a, yeah. We're going to have to get it totaled out. Right? No, no, the lady that owns it, that boy gets totaled out. So I try to help some of the younger people. Uh, I've always done that. So. As long as working with the other people. They're the bigger guys. It's already got it made. Ed Moses, I paint. And it's my obsession. When you talk to him and explain what you're looking for, he comprehends it whether we'd call he comprehends, he gets a vision of it or he gets a sense of it. And then he suggests ways to accomplish this. So the two of you get together and how to play with this thing so that it might come across. So because we're doing a transparent, is it going to pick up these bits of light that are that are brighter in there? Or what can I expect? It's all going to be like that, only you just sort of look through it. You know, can look into it, kind of. Yeah, we'll see the, the whole thing. If that's the color of what we do, we'll, we'll, shoot, we'll shoot the dark. And then we'll just put the other four into the top. That looks good. He doesn't accomplish their vision. He accomplishes an initial idea or a concept they have. But his interfacing with that person transforms this into something else. So I think he's involved with the aesthetic part of it as much as with the craft part. And I had this one, these two guys, the guy that ended up buying Mad Mad Bunts and he buys companies and they wanted to set me up in the studio just to work and build this and then bit that and whatever. I almost did it, you know, but then they own you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then they get looking at the overhead and the bottom line. Right. And I've never deal with that. So, you know, I used to spend, I used to take a big piece of my income for research. That's the reason I have that, you know, I can do those different things. Mm -hmm. You buy materials, you know, you buy this, you know. I mean, you know, who would go out and, you know, get, you know, 10 colors at $65 an ounce, you know. <laughs> I just wanted to 
shop and have everything I need which to make anything I wanted to. So, and uh, that was my ho my goal, you know, to where I could get to that point and then still make a living. And I've been working on my ranchero out there for years, you know, and it looks good, but it's still not where I want it. So I'm always building something. I have a couple of projects going. Well, it's like, it's a shop now. I built this uh, for a picnic table, uh, a candle holder, but you know, because they want that bed, and it's always in the trunk. So I put one on the thing, and it come out, and everybody said, well, you know, where did I buy one of those? And I said, well, Costco, and then either corrects it, you know, because she wants me to put them on. You know. Would you consider taking on an apprentice? Well, you know, I tried that different times. People, they, you know, they, they're interested in, to do what I do, there's a lot of it is boring, and then there's a lot of it that people didn't seem to want to. Then you're going to lay um, down the, uh, the black. Yeah, without, you know, they, part of it maybe they liked, and the other part they didn't like. So, you, you know, I don't, there's, yeah, no, I tried, and then. I thought I had one guy trained. I, I I know a guy now that probably would work, but I don't think I want to deal with it at this point. It'd been good if I'd, uh, well, if I'd had a son that was interesting. But then a lot of times the sons weren't there somehow. So I don't know. What's the next generation of art fabrication? What happens when you decide to go fishing? Or yeah, well, see, it's a difference. It's like, well, Peter Carlson, that you know, did the fire engine and did that uh, piece, but uh, the bow tie. Um, but mine's a little different. I mean, I'd, Carlson does big things, and but I don't want to do that. I like the ones that's small, interesting. One interesting job came to me when I was, uh, I had, um, I guess, the, uh, Yin Yang uh, piece was uh, electromagnet. I want to do that. Actually, the other artists had done it before. It's where you have a electromagnet in the ceiling and you just stick an object up there and it hangs. You know. Mm -hmm.